Today we have a very interesting topic that I'm going to get into and if you're pitching anything you want to get inside this edition and listen to it two, three, five, a hundred times, whatever it is, because what we're going to talk about today is a make or break topic. Whether you're raising a million dollars, raising $50 million, or you're selling something important. Now, I understand my expertise is not in selling televisions, cell phones, uh, um, pens and pencils and laptops. That's like salesmanship, not sales, account sales. I try and focus on things where you can make a million dollars. So this word, this word make is driving me crazy. Oh yeah, we have two topics today. One is language and, and uh, being specific about what you're talking about. The word make, for example, is, doesn't mean anything. If you say our company makes $10 million. No, your company makes um, widgets. Your company makes software. Your company makes, uh, provides services. It doesn't make 30 million. Oh, the federal government, they make $30 million, right? They're the only people that make money. What you do is you get revenue, you have margin, you have operating margin, you have uh, a, a GNA line, and you have income, or you have NOI, net operating income, or you have EBITDA, earnings of four. Uh, taxes or earnings before taxes and depreciation. Need to be specific about what you do and what these financial topics are. So you don't make money, you make revenue. You generate income. So that's something that is really frustrating. Uh, and, and maybe you're just in sales and that's not really financial terms aren't so relevant to you. But I believe, you know, in today's economy, at some point, even if you work for a big company, you're gonna start something on your own. You start something on your own, you're gonna need usually capital, even if it's your own capital, right? You have to explain to your accountant, your wife, your husband, uh, your, your partner, what you're doing with capital. Financial terms should not be ignored. Okay, but, but today, so we have, uh, the important topic is there's two kinds of pitches, right? One is a data pitch and one is a story pitch. And if you don't know the difference, you're pitching into a black hole and, and you don't have your stuff organized, right? So what's the difference between a data pitch and a story pitch? We're going to get into that in a minute. But I have a couple complaints. Um, and with, uh, well, <laughs> If you travel, like, you know, I have to travel, I go speak, sometimes international, sometimes it's domestic. Uh, and, and so you fly, you get off the plane, and you go to the restroom. And if you're in Chicago, if you're in San Francisco, if you're in San Diego, it's pretty simple, right? Uh, you go to the restroom, you come back, and you put your hand in front of that faucet, and water starts coming out, right? It, like, senses your hand, and water starts coming out. Uh, oh, you, you do have a soap dispenser, right? So you put your hand on the soap dispenser, it goes, it knows your hand is there, a little soap, wash your hands, put it on the water dispenser, and then you walk over, and they either have a hand thing, which blows your hands dry, or they have towels. Very simple, right? But you go anywhere else than those three airports, and like, the hand dispenser is manual, so you have to touch that thing, the water thing is swipe, but the, there's no like USB standard for bathrooms. And so, you know, you're thinking about something, you have your hand under the water and nothing's coming out. And so that one's actually a knob. And then the, but the thing is automated, even like 76 restrooms, uh, you know, at truck stops have the infrared for the tissues that come. There's no standard for bathrooms. Like someone's got to figure out a standard. So some of them you, anyway, you know what I'm saying. So like it's the same for this credit card. This credit card came, I don't know if you have one of these, this is the American Express card. It's, it's like four millimeters thick and it's made out of well, titanium or metal or something. It's American Express. Um, but it only works in like half the card readers. So, because it's so thick and it's made out of metal. So American Express like made this amazing cool credit card. It's like solid metal. It's like heavy in your hand. You're proud to have it. It's the platinum, but it doesn't work in anything. Not anything, half the things. I don't know, Express, call me. Give me a regular old plastic card. They call it plastic. I don't know what to do with a metal card. I don't know how to get soap out of the soap dispenser in the bathroom, but that's just me. All right. Uh, oh, by the way, if you're buying a car, man, 
I read this book by this negotiating, the guy who wrote a book on negotiation. I'm not supposed to name these authors anymore because my publisher gets mad at me when I get mad at other authors. So a guy whose name is beep, wrote a book on negotiation. And in the book, there is good stuff, but he's a FBI hostage negotiator. And he describes how he goes in to buy a car. He goes to the dealership. He gives them a price. They don't agree to the price, so he leaves. They call him up. He comes back in. There's all this high drama to buy a car. Eventually, using his amazing negotiation skills, he buys a car at, he, he forces them or negotiates them or grinds them or makes them frustrated enough, right? And he explains, you know, how his negotiation tactics get them into this position, but they sell him the car below cost. So the dealership loses money on the car and he gets the car incredibly cheap. Okay. Um, so to me, this is terrible. Why would you want to make a company that you're doing business with lose money? Like that is not the objective of anything that I do. Yes, I want to make a good deal. Yes, I want to, I want to sell. Yes, I want to get a million dollars in good terms. Yes, I want to sell you services and products and I want my clients and companies to sell good services and products and make good margin money. But everybody needs to be satisfied in the deal. And he's not a win-win. There's no like perfect win-win, but uh, companies need to sell their products and make margin so they can stay in business. I would never be proud of myself, Mr. Author, Negotiator, FBI hostage guy. I'd love to talk to you about this and have you on the show because you know who you are that went and did this. I would never use my skills, my powers in negotiation, in framing, in, in control, in deal making to make somebody else lose money. Where's the fun in that? Where's the benefit in that? Where's the joy in that? How is that good for anybody? Getting a car for free or below cost is, should never be your objective in negotiation. In fact, I want to teach you a negotiation strategy that I used uh, where is it? like two months ago now, to buy a Toyota 4Runner for our family. This is amazing. So I looked online, and we found the 4Runner that we wanted. We went to the local dealership here in Southern California. We walked on the lot, and we walked around the cars. It was so cool, right? The window stickers are there. We walked around. Eventually, a woman, a saleswoman woman came out, and she said, can I help you? We said, yeah, you know, we're looking at this model, the TRD Pro, with the uh, black wheels, you know, with the, with the factory lift on it, and we want to get it new. We don't want to use one. She goes, great. And then here's where I use my negotiation skills. And they're a little bit different than the guy, the hostage negotiator. Here's what I did. I go, how much is it? And she goes, it's $48,000. I go, great, I'll take it. Now I understand. <laughs> It's $48,000. All I'm going to do is spend all day negotiating her down to $46,200. I mean, they can't give the things away. They have them priced fairly economically. It's no longer the day where you can come in and it's, it's marked up $5,000 above. Like, I don't know, maybe they have $1,000 in it, $2,000 of, of margin that you can negotiate again. How long on a Saturday, I got my little boy, I got my wife, we're at a car dealership, we're trying to buy a car, move on with our lives, we already have 10 other cars, we're not stranded. Like, how much time should I invest sitting in the finance office, sitting in the manager's office, talking to this woman, going to other dealerships, getting quotes, coming back, proving we can buy at a different price. I'm gonna make $2,000, $2,000 over the life of the car, I don't know, we're gonna have that thing for five, six, seven years, our last SUV we had for, six, seven years. Uh, so what is that? Seven, $2,000. I'm going to make like $50 a month by spend. Try and come to me and say, Hey, Orrin, I want to buy your weekend for $2,000, right? You, you can't be done. I won't sell you my weekend or, or, you know, Oh, and by the way, I'm not even going to pay you today. I'm going to buy your weekend for $2,000. I'm not even going to pay you today. I'm going to pay you $50 a month for the next five years. No way. Every moment with my family, my little boy is precious, right? So, so yes, it's important to negotiate. Yes, you should try and get the most amount of margin, but you got to think about your life. Like, how am I going to live a good life? How am I take, you know, have a good weekend? What's my time worth? How much, you know, why should I grind another 
party in our deal to the point that they have no margin. So be careful. Like I teach a lot of superpowers on my Instagram, in Pitch Mastery, in my books. I teach you the skills where you can sell anything. The book is not called Pitch Something or Pitch Sometimes or Pitch Maybe. It's called Pitch Anything. People read that book, close, close, close. They make careers, they build companies, they raise money, they do amazing things, incredible projects. It's called Pitch Anything. Of course, the new book, Flip the Script. These things will give you powers to control your environment, control deals you're in, right? And we talk a lot about control on my Instagram, so don't get confused by that word. But you powers, you're an X-Men now. You read Pitch Anything, you read Flip the Script, you're an X-Men. Use your powers for good, not evil. Don't steal cars from dealerships. Don't make people's lives miserable. It's not a hostage negotiation, right? Leave, don't be a pig. Uh, I've told the story a million times. You may not have heard it. I'll tell you one more time. When I first started out in this stuff, my partner, Russ, uh, was doing deals. He, we acquired a company. Uh, he did some packaging on it. I went out to sell the company to investors. And I came back and I said, Russ, I can sell it for more. There's a lot of demand. I can sell it for more than we're asking, right? In other words, like we were going to make a million four, a million five on it. I'm like, we could probably make 2.2, 2.3 million. I can just mark it up more. He goes, listen, don't be a pig. It's a fair deal. We're making a fair amount of money. Just sell the deal out. Let's move on to the next thing. Don't be piggy. Leave something on the table, right? I learned a lot from that. So you can't over maximize the deals. If you're a good deal maker, if you're in business, if you repeatedly have stuff, uh, then, then leave some on the table for everybody. Don't over negotiate. And it's not just about leaving something on the table, but I can tell you you're gonna lose, if you over negotiate, if you grind people, if you try and jam, you know, if, you're, if you try and uh, um, get all the margin for yourself, if you sell so hard, if you're such a hard deal maker that there's nothing, uh, that there's very little on the bone, there's very little meat left for everyone else, you're gonna fatigue people. A, you're gonna get a reputation for fatiguing people, and B, you're gonna fatigue people in a deal that's important to you, not recognizing you're doing it. Now, I think this hostage negotiator guy, has he called yet? Where's my phone? Oh, they took, they take my phone away now? So when I go for the podcast, they just take my phone away because they know my, I'll just, order a pizza or call my mom or check my Instagram. Anyway, if he's called yet, I'm happy to, but, but you know, I understand uh, also when you're a hostage negotiator, you got to spend eight hours, 10 hours, two days, two weeks, two years, whatever it takes to get that hostage free, you have to do that. So you develop that mindset. Like no matter what, I have to win. You're buying a car from car salesman woman who has a family, who you're buying it from a dealership, they don't make 50% margins. They're not rich from those are thin, difficult to run businesses. Let them make a little money. So anyway, okay. If you have an opinion on that, on buying cars, I'd love to hear it because I understand I'm buying a car right now, right? I'm buying an Apex Predator uh, uh, SUV, probably the most expensive SUV on the planet, I think. If there's a more expensive one, it's like $1 more expensive. And, and so I wire them the money, I'm completely fair. Um, I trade in a car and I haven't seen my SUV yet. So I did everything I was supposed to. So no, dude, no, no good deed goes unpunished when you're buying a car. That's for sure, right? So I'd love to hear car buying stories because I think that it's like war. Like you can't go to war, right? Unless you're in the army. Right, but so, but war. If you read *On War* by von Clausewitz, war teaches so much about human psychology and the human experience. Can't go to war unless you're there. Most of us aren't. But I think car buying is the the next most interesting thing experience. It teaches about human psychology. Everybody's trying to get the most for themselves, leave the other person with the least, and you get to really see the behavior of people. In fact, if I was going to hire a chief operating officer, a CEO for my company, I would take them out and see how they buy a car or negotiate for a car. I think that is incredibly revealing about somebody's intellect, about somebody's empathy, about somebody's behavior, about somebody's just point of view on the human experience.
car buying. Tell me about your car buying experiences and I want to compare them to mine and I'm happy to be complimentary or critical of what you're doing in terms of frame control, control deal making. I'm not going to pick on you personally unless you're an author of a book on negotiation. Then it's free game. I can pick on you whenever I want. Okay. Uh, I think we have Andy on the phone today. Andy, are you around? Hey, what's up, Warren? Hey, Andy. Okay, um, I believe the podcast is over. Thanks for coming. All right. Hey, it was great listening. Thanks for having me. Yeah. I really appreciate it. That's great. Uh, if you can do, if you could do this again tomorrow, that'd be great. Uh, no. So I want to talk quickly about this. There's two kinds of pitches, as I mentioned. Right. There's a data pitch, and there's a story pitch. And you got to figure out which one you have. And people, nine out of ten times, ten out of ten times, they mix the two, right? High concept, mm. high story with lots of data to make the data case. So in your mind, you're very good at unpacking these things. Where do we take this conversation next? I know that's abstract. Let's try and anchor it down and make it real in the, uh, in the time we have. Well, I am curious about this because I kind of has always been under the impression that you're just supposed to find the story in whatever it is that you're pitching. So I guess, uh, are you saying that there's some pitches that are just data where, where there's no story involved in it? Like, what, what is the difference between a data pitch and a story pitch, and how do you tell which yeah. one you're dealing with? So I think we have to separate the word story and narrative. Most people think that's the same thing. Story, narrative, right? They're just synonyms, antonyms, uh, uh, homilies, analogies, metaphors for each other. A story, so yeah, yeah. So, so I think you do have narratives in a data pitch, right? So, so for example, um, um, let me see. Let me give a good, uh, good example of a data pitch is a um, what do we? Oh my God! It's get to a point where we're on like a thousand companies and you can't remember one of them. <laughs> All right, uh, here's one. So, so we had a company selling like glucosamine for uh, pets, right? It's a large business. Say it's like, you know, 40, probably a hundred million dollar business, right? So our client, and they're selling glucosamine and joint medication for pets. Um, I understand pets don't buy um, joint medication, but their owners, you know, they're now called companions. You know, they, people love their pets. When they start to see the pet slowing down, they want to get the medication to make the pet feel happy and good, right? So yeah, right. Um, um, really the, the narrative is just that, right? Which is there are 18 million companion animals in the United States. It might be like 30 more, it might be like 30 million. There's 30 million companion animals in the United States, cats, dogs, uh, I think that's it. Any other companion animals I'm leaving turtles? out? Turtles. Yeah. Right. <laughs> no, there's not. There's not like eight million companion turtles. Cats and dogs. And it's mainly it's mainly dogs. So you know, I think it's something like you know, 12, 15 million companion dogs in uh, ho in households that have high disposable income, right? And so they yeah. don't just buy treats and food. When the animals begin to age, and as we know, you know, dogs age faster, they look for parallels in human medication that would make sense for the dog to alleviate discomfort, pain, and slowing down, right? And the number one among that is joint medication, right? Because you could, you know, you have a pet, you've been with the pet for many years, you can start to see when they're starting to feel a little bit of pain, arthritis, you know, joint pain, so it just makes sense. Glucosamine, for joint pain, right? When uh, um, owners of companion pets start to see their pets slowing down, they look for parallels in human medication, they look to alleviate that pain, uh, and they can tell when the medication is working, whether it's placebo or good medication. Glucosamine is the number one uh, most effective non-prescription treatment of joint pain. The total addressable market is $54 billion in the United States for companion. So that's a narrative, right? Right. Then for that company, we just start rolling into the data, right? 
And I'm, I'm not saying you have to give raw percentages and raw numbers, but it's really a day. There's no story because the volume of companion animals is not increasing at some crazy rate, like social media, like use of digital photography, like the onset of artificial intelligence, right? Like, you know, yesterday Mrs. Jones had one dog, tomorrow she's gonna have one dog, and a year from now she's gonna have one or zero dogs, <laughs> okay? There's not really a story here. There is, we understand this market, the market is segmented in certain segments where our products are very effective. We are leading or we're top one, two, or three in that market. We distribute through Walmart and Target and Costco. Walmart, Target, and Costco order certain volumes, right, repeatedly, and these volumes are growing, you know, 1% a year, 1% a quarter, whatever it is. If you extrapolate, interpolate, do a reg regression of how these numbers are growing, we expect to be at 120 million next year, 140 million the year after that, and following that point, we have enough data, our financials are seasoned enough, our brands are good enough, we expect to either be acquired by a large food manufacturer for pets or we expect to go public, okay? That's a data-driven narrative, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, there is a story to it, but it's just the story you're telling is numbers. It's numbers and it's A, verifiable, B, your assumptions fit map to how other similar companies have grown and been successful. I would say that, I mean, just play that over. There's like that rewind button, 15 seconds, hit that, play that over and over. The assumption in a data pitch the assumptions that you're giving people are reasonable. They make sense. They fit known reality. And they map to how all other companies that do what you do or are similar were successful. Yep. That just allows the listeners to just say, I get it, and just see how what you're telling them makes sense. Story pitch. Yesterday, you and I were driving to work right? And yep. at the side of the freeway, we saw the weirdest thing. Can you, do you remember what that was? It was very strange. It was weird, wasn't it? It doesn't sound like you remember. Totally bizarre. <laughs> do you remember? I don't know what we're talking about. Okay. It's okay to say no. That's a good lesson. Sometimes okay. you're supposed to know something because you were actually there. That's how you were supposed to know it. There. And we talked about it for like five minutes but today you don't remember it, that's okay. Sometimes super geniuses like Andy have this like, uh, the bucket gets too full. Okay, so what it was, it was this lawnmower, it was a, a, a city worker mowing the lawn in the median along the highway with an industrial mower. The only difference between what you're picturing in your mind and what was really there is he wasn't sitting on it, he was operating it with this like remote control device. We're like, why is a guy, like I'm just lost, why is a guy sitting, uh, standing 10 feet away from a mower that he's operating when he could just as easily be sitting on it? Like it doesn't sort of make sense. He's right there anyway, and the mower is mowing. So uh, I don't, it, by the way, if you're in the mowing industry or the lawn industry or the lawn care, or I don't know, whatever you call it, please tell us what's going on here because we don't know, we're just trying to guess. But whatever the case is, whoever pitched to build that product, right, or pitched to customers to buy it, or pitched to in, um, uh, private equity or venture capital, get the money to design it, build it, produce it, or you know maybe it's a Toro, we couldn't see the brand, pitched internally to get the research and development financing to build a remote control industrial side of the freeway, large format lawnmower, like they, it was not a data pitch. It was a story pitch. There's no data to show that the world needs this, right? There was some kind of story about safety, about return on investment, but mm. it had to be built. Somebody had to take the risk that it could be built because that wasn't clear. Like, we know we could make glucosamine for pets. 
right? There's no question about that among academics, among scientists, among researchers. Like, if you go to any, like, college chemist and go, could you make glucosamine for pets? He'd go, yeah, can you come back in five minutes? I'll have a hundred gallons ready for you. Right? <laughs> you go to the same guy, you go to any guy at Carnegie Mellon, robotics, you know, um, uh, my brother works in robotics. And you say, hey, can you build a remote control, ground controlled industrial mower um, that can, has all these benefits? You'd be like, I don't know, give me $30 million, I'll try. Right, it's story driven. So, right. all right. Okay, so anytime that there's like a direct comparison for what you're trying to do, or it's like you're doing something that you can just directly point to numbers and say, look, this has been done before, this will work because of X, Y, Z, then it's a data pitch. But anytime when you're trying to do something that's a little new or novel or that you can't just point directly to someone else who's already done something like it, that's when you need a story pitch. Absolutely. And so... Uh, any time you say, hey, I think the world needs a remote controlled industrial lawnmower and you try and use data to prove that case, you're just going to hurt the brain of people looking at your thing. Now, there's a lot more to a pitch. Uh, uh, if you're actually doing a pitch and you need to raise $1 million, $5 million, there's more to it. If you're trying to sell something that's high stakes, uh, and, and, you know, there's obviously more to it than this basic simplicity of de deciding, is this a data pitch or is this a story pitch? But um, uh, we could definitely help with that. One thing is get on our Instagram because we give a lot of just one minute tools that you can use for frame control. Frame control is really what we're talking about. Is this frame a data frame or is it a story frame, right? Frame control mm. is absolutely key to all this. Once you understand frames, where do you learn most about frames? Pitch anything, chapter two, that's where the world has learned about frames, frame control. If you really need help, uh, hunt around, go to workwithorn.com and you're working on a big project, high stakes, we can all make a lot of money, I'll try and help you with it. Otherwise, we'll see you back here tomorrow and we'll hit more about frame control, control, deal making, negotiation, sales, selling, business development, business in general. This has been Norm Claff Project. It is uh, middle of the week. Now it's back for me to get back to the coal mine and do my day job, which is where I learn about all this stuff. All this stuff. The same for you. You're back to your day job. See you tomorrow.